Well, welcome to this screencast of the second of John Donne's Holy Sonnets that we're going to study in this course. This one's called At the Round Earth's Imagined Corners Blow, and it's generally regarded as number seven in the list of Donne sonnets, or, although I've seen it numbered differently, but that's, uh, that's by the by. This one really does test the limits of God's patience with Donne, I think. He... Um, he asked God in this poem to unleash his apocalypse on the world, as laid down in the book of Revelations, the, the final book of the Bible. So it is a pretty big ask for a, uh, for a mortal, but done sort of has a good reason at the end, well, so close to a good reason anyway. Now before we get into this poem, we do need to talk about structure. Now this, as per usual, with Dunn's sonnets is a Petrarchan sonnet, which means it's written with three quatrains and a couplet at the end. But if we go to the first eight lines at the turn, you'll notice that um, the two quatrains here are joined together with a semicolon. There's no full stop here. So the first eight lines are meant to be read as one sentence. And that's important. And there's a lot of enjambment going on here. You do have to read it by running on through the lines. You don't stop at the end of, uh, of each of the lines unless specifically asked to by the punctuation. So that's important when you're reading that you get a sense that the first eight lines really do um, almost take up one or two breaths as you go through. Having said that, we're probably going to stop at the first quatrain here and grab a breath because there's a lot to talk about before we go on to this next uh, set of four lines. All right, let's get started. At the round earth's imagined corners, blow your trumpets, angels, and arise. Arise from death, you numberless infinities of souls, and to your scattered bodies go. So if you notice there, I, I read through the end of those lines because if you don't you can't quite pick up the meaning and there's quite a direct allusion here to um, chapters 7 and 8 of the book of revelations now in those chapters we have angels heading to the four angels heading to the four corners of the earth and blowing their trumpets and are uh, and which is telling all these souls to awaken it's the start of the apocalypse where and the idea of the apocalypse is that all the souls that have ever died on the face of the earth they awake and they go off and they find their bodies so they head all over the world and come into their bodies now there's a blending of the of chapters 7 and 8 because there's chapter 8 of the book of revelations talks about seven archangels or seven angels now we would in the Roman Catholic tradition, we would probably only refer specifically or generally to three archangels. Uh, so that would be Michael, Gabriel and Raphael. Um, but other traditions, other Christian traditions and Islamic and Jew, uh, Jewish traditions would have up to seven or eight archangels. Right? So they would have more characters in their traditions. Either way, um, Book of Revelations talks about seven angels blowing their trumpets but they also talk about four angels heading to the four corners of the earth, blowing their trumpets and awaking the dead, waking the souls, and off they go into their bodies. And this is what Dunn's talking about here. At the round earth's imagined corners, so the four corners of the earth, even though we know, by, Dunn knows, and we know by this stage that the earth is round, in the book of Revelations, the writer, John of Patmos, generally, we understand it to be, didn't know the earth was round, so he would talk about the angels going to the four corners of the earth. So he's blending new and past knowledge here of the earth. Blow your trumpets, so the angels are blowing them, and arise, arise from death, you numberless infinities of souls, and to your scattered bodies go. So all he's saying is, he's ordering these angels to begin the the um the apocalypse as john of patmos laid down in the book of revelations the final book of the um of the bible all right so it's a big call he's he's triggering the apocalypse um thinking that he can probably 
get it started. I don't know. I would have thought he would have needed God's say so first, but um, apparently not. All right. So this is what this this quatrain is about. But as we mentioned before, it runs on into the next one, All right. and it talks more specifically about um, those souls and um, how they died and um, and the, the the different conditions of the different souls. All right. So all whom the flood did and the fire shall overthrow. All whom war, dearth, age, agues, tyrannies, despair, law, chance hath slain. So this is this is everybody. We know this because Dunn lists out all the different ways that individuals could have died. So they could have died in the flood, the great flood that Noah had, and the fire. You know, some would have died of fire, some from war, some from death, some poverty or starvation, old age, agues, which is another word for sickness, tyrannies. So basically, they were they were killed by um, by the authorities. Despair took their own life. Law they were executed by um, after undergoing a, a court of uh, justice, or just chance. Yeah, you know, they just fell fell over a cliff one day and died. Whatever. So Dunn lists out these huge numbers of, of ways that individuals could have died. Uh, and pretty much covers everything, really. Flood, fire, war, dearth, age, sickness, tyrannies. All have slain. And you, and there's another group, whose eyes shall behold God and never taste death's woe. This is the group that is actually alive when the apocalypse occurs. And so they end up cheating death and getting the free ride up into eternal life because this world ends and we the kingdom has come and we are moving into the eternal realm so this this lot those who are alive now um, skip death's woe they're the lucky lot All right. but you do have to be part of the group that is selected now the book of revelations is clear 144,000 that are alive at this particular time, the time of the apocalypse, will be saved. The rest will not be saved. Yeah. And this is what Dunn is worried about. I want to be part of the good group, the group that's saved at this particular time. All right, so this is the end of the eighth line. And look, it's not particularly difficult, this this lot. It's, it's just this direct allusion to the book of Revelations, a listing out of uh, sorry, telling the angels to blow their trumpets and begin the uh, the apocalypse, a listing out of all the um, the dead and how they've died, and um, and a reference to those that are still living at the time and and that that will have judgment passed upon them. One hundred forty-four thousand will live; the rest will not live. All right, so. We have the turn, and again, as per usual, the. Um, the tone and the message changes. So Dunn has called the apocalypse forward here, and then he changes his mind, of course. But let them sleep, Lord. So basically he has chilled out and just gone, well, actually, if uh, if the apocalypse is um, triggered, maybe, maybe I won't be part of um, that 144,000, maybe my sins will be greater than some of the others and I'm not going to make the cut. So he's worried about this. So he decides, despite his earlier bravado, that maybe we can just stop it now. Sorry about that, God. I didn't really mean to trigger the apocalypse. Can we just ch take a chill pill and give me some more time, please? Right. And w let's read what he says here. Um, in this quatrain and we do notice that this quatrain has no ending punctuation as well it runs on into the couplet but we'll we'll just look at this couplet um, this quatrain first before we get to the to the the ending couplet all right but let them sleep lord 
and me mourn a space. And he's saying, well, actually, let's can we just leave him there for a bit longer and let me mourn these people a little bit more? Which is a little bit disingenuous. We wonder whether Dunn really is mourning all these people or whether he's just feeling a little bit worried about himself. But anyway, for if above all these my sins abound, if my sins are greater than those who have died, tis late to ask the abundance of thy grace. If if it's judged that my sins are greater than the other people or those that have died in the past or those that are alive now, uh, well, it's going to be very late in the day for me to ask for your grace. I'm going to need more time to clear my ledger, to do my penances, to get my get my slate up to date so I can be part of this group that's going to be redeemed. So it is late to ask abundance of thy grace when we are there. You know, when we are about when we're being judged, it's too late to ask for your help. So he says and this is we've got another bit of enjambment here for the so the couplet is here but it really starts in the twelfth line, halfway through the twelfth line. Here on this lowly ground, teach me how to repent. So he's saying that it, we come down to the to the real issue here. He wants God to teach him how to repent of his sins, how to become pure, how to purify his heart of his sins. For that's as good as if thou had sealed my pardon with thy blood. So there's a there's an illusion here, or sorry, a metaphor here that that um, Dunn's getting a pardon. You know, this idea that he could get a pardon if it was sealed with God's blood. You know, it could be a written document sealed with the, the blood of Christ as he spilt on the cross, and that would get him into heaven. All right, so he's saying, but that's not going to happen. What he's saying is, if he could just teach him to repent, it would be as good as this. It would be as good as getting a free pass into heaven. Because if you could just teach me to do it properly, I would do it as much as possible. I would purify my heart to the greatest of my ability. I just don't know how and I need help to do that. It would be, a, I would be so pure, it would be like you giving me a free pardon into heaven. Like I had a piece of paper with your blood on it to say, let this guy in. All right. So this is what this sonnet's about. It really is a far more, I think, um, in the end anyway, a far more um, penitential sonnet than Batter My Heart. Bad of my heart is a little bit confused, I think, in terms of the, the violence of the metaphors. You know, this this is just a guy despairing. He says to God with lots of bravado, Oh, unleash your Well he doesn't say to God, he says it directly to the angels, unleash your apocalypse now. Let's go. And then as he's saying it, he's realizing that actually he's quite vulnerable here. He is a guy who could not make, he may not make it into heaven because of the list of sins that he has on his ledger. So he says to God, please, sorry about that. I probably spoke too soon. Don't unleash your apocalypse just yet. If you could teach me how to repent, if you could teach me how to purify my heart, give me some more time to do it, then I would work so hard at that that it would be as good as having a pardon into heaven. All right, and that is the Holy Sonnet. So quite simple in many ways. Obviously the main allusion is to the book of Revelations here. Um, and he continues, on, he, he continues on with that allusion all the way through. Uh, we have this metaphor of the sealing of this sort of written pardon with God's, Jesus' blood from the crucifixion on it to get him a free pass into heaven. But really, it's a it's a simple poem about repentance, about wanting to repent, desperately, desperately, um, and passionately wanting to repent of his sins, so that he can show God um, how de how devoted he is to him. All right, I hope that helps. Thank you.